You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Uh, Ryan Taz, your hair looks nice today. Thank you. Yeah. That's nice. Do you uh, put product in your hair? I don't. I do. Uh, I do. You do? Mm -hmm. Well, your hair looks up. Sorry, it looks all right. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> thanks. It's sticking up. I know sometimes I, once you put the headphones on, it's all yeah. Somehow your hair is perfect with headphones. Thanks. That's what I'm going for. Yeah. Well, you headphones by L'Oreal. Huh? Headphones by L'Oreal. That's right. Headphones by L'Oreal. <laughs> um, great uh, episode today. If you haven't seen Wet Hot American Summer, if you haven't seen Role Models and a slew of so many projects, super talented guy. Like Fleetwood Mac, he goes his own way. Um, he's just, he, David Wayne is, uh, he's a great guy. I've jammed with him at his house. He's hes a kid like me in a lot of ways. He just, uh, you know, he's obviously responsible, has kids, does this thing, but you know, there's just a, a, a youthful feel to him. And I like that. He was easy to talk to. And we've known each other since 1998, but we were never really close or anything, but we were always like, oh, I like him. I hope he likes me. Um, and it was really great to have him. Um, just before we get started, if you guys will, if you're new, if you're David Wayne fans, uh, listen to the podcast just for him. Hopefully you'll listen to more episodes if you like this. And uh, I hope you do. Um, our handles are, Ryan. At Inside of You Pod on Twitter, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. That's right. You can watch on YouTube. Uh, write a review. Mm -hmm. It really helps the podcast. And if you want to join Patreon to help support the podcast, we need you. Without my patrons, I couldn't do the show. Patreon.com slash Talkville. There's top tiers. I read their names at the end of every episode. I send boxes of merch that I pack and I sign little notes to each person and they become like a family. Also, you can go to the Inside You online store and get awesome stuff like Lexmas scripts signed by me and Inside of You mugs and tumblers and Smallville lunch boxes and the ship keys signed by me from Smallville and many other great things. Uh, you can also go to my other podcast, talkvillepodcast.com and get tons of cool merch and original art and uh, all that stuff. Uh, also, my band is out there. If you want to support the band, Sunspin, two words, Sunspin, go to sunspin.com. You could Zoom with me, you could buy merch, and uh, you can listen to our new album, Never Is What It Is, anywhere you stream. So I hope you'll give it a chance. Listen to What Are We Here For? It's the theme song to Talkville that will give you an idea of what we're going for and uh, trying to build an audience for that. So if, if you want to do that, that's great. I'm asking a lot of you. Uh, we're going to a lot, we're going to Chicago. Mm -hmm. This weekend, uh, Tom Welling and I, we're going to be doing pictures and autographs and hugs and a lot of energy. Grab a Red Bull. You'll need it. And um, what else can I say? What else can you say? I think that's really it. Did I miss anything? No. I don't think so. I hope you're having a great week. Um, you know, uh, I, I have a, you know, I had an incredible weekend last weekend. Um, can't really talk about it, but oh. good stuff. And a lot of stuff in the works. So I'm hoping, you know, I'm being more more creative, trying to get projects going along and, uh, you know, keeping the uh, keeping the podcast alive. And uh, again, Talkville is our new podcast on the side. We watch every episode of Smallville, Ryan, for the mm -hmm. first time ever, me mostly for the first time. <laughs> and we review it. And uh, that's Talkville podcast. Even ones that you are in the right. entirety of mm -hmm. that are based around you mm -hmm. that's got to be fun uh eh, sometimes it's fun sometimes i'm annoyed with myself i'm like ah you did that because you're hamming it up whatever uh i hope you enjoy the podcast let's get let's just do it let's just dive in let's mm. uh get inside of david wayne it's my point of view you're listening to inside of you with michael rosenbaum Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio. It is, and it what is. station is this on? WKDQ 99.5 FM. W-A-I-N. W-A-I-N. David Wayne all day long. Uh, boy, is it a treat to have you here. I, I Listen, I'm, I'm excited about this. Are those real, those Muppets up, up, up there? Uh, well, they don't, they're not alive. But, that, but are they, I mean, you know. There's obviously a big difference between a toy and an actual. You mean the original? Or one that might have been used. No. no. I had those made. 
there was this woman in Australia that I met at a convention, and she had these puppets. And I was like, wow, can you make me a Princess Leia? Could you make me a- Hello, uh, Barry the Lead. This guy's been to Australia. Hello. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Why didn't we start with that? <laughs> I've really done it. I've made a name for myself. My God. Um, first of all, explain when you got out of your car, I noticed there was in a Rubik's Cube. Yeah. What's, I, what's that about? Uh, well, uh, a lot of things I do are like I'm 11 years old because there's a part of me that just is. And so in my mid 40s, I'm now in my mid 50s. Oh my God. Are you really? Well, I'm 53. Wow. That's not quite mid. Don't go there yet. Okay. I'm not going to go there. I'm on the right side of 55. Yeah. Let's are. say that. I like that. Um, Sometime in my mid forties, I picked up that Rubik's cube and I'm like, fuck it. I got to learn this for the first time. And I stopped my life and got really good at it for a second. <laughs> How long did it take you to, to, to actually do it the first time you did it? Well, I followed, and anyone can solve a Rubik's cube in 10 minutes. If you follow the instructions, it's not that complicated to do. The challenge is how fast you can do it. And my son, for example, can do it in under 20 seconds. Um, what? I can do it in about 50 seconds. <laughs> that that seems astonishing to me. It is astonishing. It's a great. It's it, learning the Rubik's cube for me was a wonderful uh, expression of how you can learn something that seems impossible, and day by day, time by time, you get a tiny bit better at it. And that thing that seemed like a magic trick or impossible at first is like, oh, now I can do it. You know? I've never done it. I always, I have one. I just think it's impossible. I, I you know what I think? It's weird because as a, we've gotten into this before, gotten into this about like, I never thought I was very smart. I never thought it. And I, I just, was I like, never did either. But I, I, yeah, that's still how I feel. That little boy in me about stuff feels, you. oh, you can't do an Rubik's Cube. You're not smart enough. So don't even go there. Right. That's for smart people, Rubik's Cubes. But you're saying I could do it probably. You really could. It's just like anything. It's you learn it and it's like, it's a way you can learn it. And it's, it's kind of fun. I have to say it's a fun adult activity to learn how to actually properly solve a Rubik's Cube. Did you hear that guys? You could actually do in a Rubik's Cube. I think we should try that. I think we should. Yeah. You just have to decide to take a little time and not just try to jump to the end. Like how much time are we talking? I don't know. I mean, taking an hour or two here and there for a few weeks. You're probably good at those Cracker Barrel games too. What I would do though <laughs> is I would get obsessed. Then I would like sit and do it for hours because I just was like, I got to get this. I got to. I got to nail this. And of course, anything in the world that you really want to learn, there's there's YouTube. It's true. Tutorials. You so also many. brought cards with you. Well, the magic tricks thing has been always for my whole life since I'm born. You do magic tricks. Yeah. Well, that, could you do one today? I mean, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Like you brought them, just in but case. But I just have them always. That's just, you know. That's just, just who you are. It's just part of me. Um, first of all, I uh, I text your good friends, Joe Latruglio and Ken Marino. My name's David Wayne, by the way. Yeah. Just to start there. David Wayne. We, we do that in the beginning. Okay. Before you even come. Okay. Do an intro. All right. So they're going to know all about this stuff. Great. Here I am. And we're going to get into it. Did you, you know, I've done that before where I'm on a podcast and they never talk about who I am or what I've done or anything. I'm like, no one's going to know who the fuck. Yeah. Unless they happen to know you're by voice and by fandom, <laughs> which is true for many. Some, some, some people. Yeah. You have a lot of fans. I do have some, fa I would say I, I'm one of those people that has a very, very small, but devoted uh, group of fans. Yeah. Which is great. Joe, both of these are sort of non sequiturs to me. I don't, I don't know what these mean. Joe Latrugli said, ask about Leonard Gaines. He was a New York University <laughs> professor who taught an African-American music class that you took. Yes, uh, he was great. Um, this guy, Joe and I took an African-American music class at NYU. And this guy just had a very funny way of being. Um, one of the things that we always remember is he, somebody asked him, you know, he was a former trumpet player. And they said, well, do you ever play now? The normal question, you know, say, the professor, do you ever play trumpet yourself now? And he's like, no, I, I just don't do it anymore. If I, if I did it, I would still be doing it, but I just don't do it anymore. <laughs> just kind of <laughs> angrily. Yeah, and we're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I always remember was he would say, uh, you know, there was the country blues and there was the city blues and then there was Blind Lemon Jefferson. And the thing about Blind Lemon Jefferson is no one can out Blind Lemon Jefferson, Blind Lemon Jefferson. And no one can out Fletcher Henderson, Fletcher Henderson. 
And you just had a very funny time. <laughs> a teacher you'll never forget. There are very few teachers like that, wouldn't you say, that sort of stick in your memory? Oh my God, very, very few. I had one that was a, uh, it was a, a sound class, sound design in college. And I just remember he goes, the first thing he said, that's all I remember is, what is sound? Yeah. <laughs> sound is vibrating uh, air. Sound is the thing I like to hear coming out of my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember. Dr. Waslowski. Wadlowski or something like that. And okay, Ken Marino, another member of the state, yes. as Joe Latruglia was. You guys went to NYU together. We did. Joe, uh, Ken says... Uh, something about kaja taking fits. Have you had any kaja taking <laughs> fits lately? Kaja taking yeah. fits. What are kaja taking fits lately? So the, both both of those are just references to like things that I don't shut up about. Uh, when I <laughs> so dumb. When I was like eight in in elementary school, some weird old man g came and told us funny stories. Like some like some guy came and I don't know, and he was like, "Have you ever heard about kaja taking fits?" You know, like my, my, my uncle would t take the cod and he's like, how much cod you taking? And he had cod you taking fits. I don't even know what it was. But then I, I would just do my own telephone game of telling that same story apropos of nothing in the middle of like a writer session sometimes. And people would be like, what the fuck are you talking about? And, uh, so, um, it was just sort of a very weird the random words that would come out of my mouth and that Ken Marino remembered. <laughs> that's sort of, I feel like that you guys have a lot of those inside things, those well, that's weird, the weird little things that yes. you do. The bizarre thing is, you know, we're all in our early fifties mm, and yes, yes. I still work together very often with different members of the state who were right. these guys we met when we were 18 years old. And so there's many decades of weird, random shorthand or inside little references. And so we might be in a, meeting about something with me and Ken Marino and X and Y and Z. And I'll make a little weird. I'll be like in the middle of a sentence, I'll be like, God, taking fit. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just to make Ken laugh. And everyone else is like, what are you talking about? So you just do it to make that person. I think I do that with it's my friends too. It's subconscious. It's sort of, we all do that. Yeah. yeah but, I think everybody does it, but that's nice. Yeah. Uh, look, dude, you've done so many things and you have a, a very, you have a brand. David Wayne has a brand. You're a brand, dude. Um, that's original. That's unique. That no one, very few people have a brand. A lot of people can make movies and TV, and it's sort of linear. Although it's these of, days, it's all about the brand, isn't it? They, everybody talks about the brand. You got to have, they? have your, your niche on your I, TikTok I channel. Or, well, I don't you know. have that. You were, I don't know what it was. I, I know it yeah. started with the state, but Wet Hot American Summer, Role Models, Wonderlust, they came together. Wet Hot American Summer, the series. Uh, yeah. I mean, all these things, the, the, the sort of your sense of humor, the, the what you find funny, it's just a quirky, different take on comedy. It's like your own, like you said, niche kind of thing, your yeah. brand. Yeah. And that started, you'd say, did it start at a young age where you always sort of just going for a laugh, trying to make, who, what was it like growing up as a Wayne? I definitely was the class clown of my family. Um, I would entertain my family. Uh, yeah, I was the youngest by far of, uh, I'm three much older sisters and my parents. And, and I would just, do shtick and during dinner and you know um but i think that my slightly off kilter kind of jokes i would make were encouraged by people around me and 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 i got uh, you know confidence in that somehow and i really loved steve martin and i loved woody allen and sort of their weirder absurdist makes sense notions and um then I was just had this incredibly lucky uh, happenstance of meeting a bunch of like-minded people right when I got to NYU and finding that my, you know, sense of humor is not identical to theirs, but it was complimentary enough that we really all encouraged each other and learned from each other instead of from some higher mentor or teacher or book or something. We really, we really mostly taught each other everything. And so... I guess I emerged and, and also just had the lucky uh, chance to have it, have the opportunity to make things like Wet Hot American Summer where, and the state and all those early things where we were allowed to do this, these projects the way we wanted to and, and, and follow these weird um, humorous tangents that uh, maybe in a, in a more normal business situation, they'd be like, you can't do that, cut that out, you know, or, 
<laughs> the way I used to talk about it was like it, the, the thing you joke about at the dinner table, but then you're like, well, we're not really going to do that in the thing, you know, and be like, no, let's do that in the thing. And yeah. so that, that kind of is, but it was, none of this was ever really like that conscious. We were just like, we're doing what's funny. And, and I always think about when we were doing our show, Stella on comedy central. Um, I saw Stella live. Sure. Yeah. So oh, Stella's live. And I just, I remember it, it was so funny. If you guys get a chance and you sell this, the DVDs, that's the only way you could, way you could find them. Is yeah, that true? And then they, well, they sold out. They sold uh, out of the Stella shorts. Yeah. But the original Stella shorts, you can still see them online though. You um, can. But uh, that we had, we found a bunch of old DVDs of it and sold them and they sold I out still in quote two, two seconds. I still quote this one <laughs> thing where I went to the show and look, it's, it's a little toilet humor, but it's so funny. There's this one sketch where uh, the family is having dinner and the mom's, you know, mom just is freaking out and she she farts on stage. I don't know if you remember this. You probably don't. And the, and the, and the, somebody goes and she storms out of the room. And then she starts puking. And then somebody says, everything's fine, guys. The family, we're doing fine. And somebody goes, fine. Mom just barfed and farted. Oh, right, oh, right, right. <laughs> How right. are we fine or something? That was the state. Was that the state? Yeah, that was uh, really funny. And he's like, and she barfed and she farted. <laughs> and she <laughs> farted. Like, just weird pronunciations. Yeah, that was, I, I remember that. That was, I think, a Showalter piece. Yeah. But, but, that's, uh, but that's sort of all your sense of humor. Yeah. To do ridiculous things like that. Totally. In the state. Now, but, but I remember, I was going to just say, we were doing do that it. show Stella on Comedy Central. And- in retrospect, I can acknowledge that was a very weird show. But at the time, we were like, we're just doing a funny show. Like, it's just funny, like a sitcom, like funny, like friends. You know, it didn't occur to us that it was that off to the left. As, as And then when it went on the air, the response was either like, this is terrible, I hate it, or this is the most bizarre, you know, why would anyone, it's no surprise that it wouldn't get picked up for another season. But um we're just doing what we do. And so I don't but, know. But is it is it hard when you're doing something that you find funny, that you know is different, that you don't get picked up for another season or whatever, like the state, right? You did it like 25 episodes? We did, we ended up doing, yeah, it was sort of four seasons worth over, but they were very tiny seasons. Yeah. Right. But did you did you ever feel at some, and I want to get back to your childhood and that stuff, but like, did you ever feel at some point in your life, you're like, well, maybe... I should go more mainstream comedy because maybe that's what they want and, and try almost fighting yourself and your instincts all the time. Of course. And you and, still do that. Well, and I'd say I do it even more now because now I have bills to pay and I have kids and you know, and it, the, the, the whims of the marketplace for me go up and down all the time. Of course, it's never been a consistent ride ever. You know, it's always been like slow periods and then things go better. And, but, uh, for the most part, mostly throughout my career, whenever I've talked to any of the powers that be, whether it's rep reps or producers, studios, they're always like, oh, we're a big fan of what you do, but we can't do that here. You know, like, and so it's always been that push pull of like, do we do something more mainstream or more down the middle? You know, do you like any down the middle? Do you, is there something? I love, I love down the middle. I mean, I mean, depending on how you define it, but. The most mainstream thing I ever did was with this role models movie, yeah, and it, and, and I loved Hilarious. it. I loved every second of it, and and that was us sort of layering in our point of view in a much very straightforward vessel, and I thought that was a wonderful experience, and I've wanted to do that type of thing again. Um, and also, I love like one of my favorite movies of all time is like Miss Congeniality. Like I, <laughs> no joke, like amazing. I love 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 straightforward stuff too and and i mostly consume as a uh as a tv watcher or a movie watcher non-comedic stuff in the first place you know I, I i think of it less like being at work and so on my free time i watch breaking bad you know right did you f ever feel like sort of compelled like in your later years after you kind of created wet hot american summer and all these different things in the state and did you ever feel like compelled to be weird or quirky or off just so you, you almost like you couldn't really truly be you you were trying to be someone else as growing up does that make sense so yes it makes total sense a great question and the answer is not really it, it's usually the opposite it's usually i'm trying to do or or i'm in a place where i'm assigned to do something and i'm naturally looking to push it weirder and i have to 
stop that because it's not what we're doing. You know, right. like whether I'm directing a regular TV show or something, you know, and, and uh, we're or we're struggling with a, stri- a script moment. I'm like, well, you know, if we were doing this like in a vacuum, I would say let's have him, you know, s- s- turn around and jump in a pool of water here or, or something weird. And and but I'm like, I know we can't do that, so let's. Do, you know, <laughs> that always comes to you. Let's do the harder way. <laughs> right. Um, but no, I l- luckily I don't think the. Uh, the demand for my brand is so uh, actually uh, existent that people are like, you've got to be weird. And I, and I feel pressure to be, right. uh, you know, in any way more off than I am. And I'm not that off. I'm just like a dude. <laughs> yeah, you are a dude. But do you ever think like some people might think, I guess studios would think, oh, it's a risk because it's that certain brand. And we don't know if that's going to either hit or not. hit. It's too much of a risk. Oh, we want something time. more mainstream. And well, you- I, I feel like I've, consistently my whole career not gotten work because people are like oh he can only do that like he's his stuff is funny but it's too weird for us you know and and, and you're like no i i can do the other side i did role models i do i do some- exactly and also i can i've do, i've i've done the range of things over time and uh you know i can handle you know as a director it's sometimes been frustrated because i've i've done such a wide variety of styles and levels and and uh media and um as you said the brand can have um a double edge to it and people are like oh he's the guy who just does like really goofy dumb things and so we have this thing that we have real feeling about and it matters to us so there's no way that he could handle that yeah and i'm like oh. do you just feel like you have to fight more these days for, for something you're passionate about or do you and you, you still obviously write your own stuff Yes, I do. I, I've always generated my own stuff, um, but I also do feel like, yeah, I, I think just the natural uh, progression and uh, getting older, and I'm not in the, I'm not in that, I'm not young anymore, and I'm a middle aged white guy in Hollywood, and I, I definitely have to, I feel like I have to work harder to get heard, and that's fine. But you know, another cool thing is you think, you think looking at your resume and looking at the people who follow you, looking at the people who want to be in your movies, who, who are consistently cast in your movies, yeah. like the Paul Rudds yeah. like, and all these other names that you see, these big names, they obviously love you and love your mind and want to work with you. Yeah. So that should excite studios. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it should. Right. And it sometimes does. Yeah. It, it also is like, you know, <clears throat> as you know, as we all know, writing something coming up with something is starting from scratch every time and you're reinventing the wheel every time so uh, you know it's just a question of like uh, a lot of times if i have a thing which and i've got all these things going right now for example that i'm developing and hopefully gonna start shooting and but you have to start from scratch every time so you're like okay what's another idea that feels real to me that feels true that is funny and that could sell and then you're just starting from a blank page every time, so it's it's never easy. How many how many projects do you have just in, r- you're working on right now? I kind of at the moment I, it, it's in different phases. I have I guess like maybe three features and maybe like five TV things. But that's I think <laughs> that's, that's a lot of things. But it's too it's a it's at it's a combination for me honestly of both too much and not enough. Like because the. I don't like to be spread thin. I'm not happy when I'm working on even more than one project. I'm most happy yeah. when I'm fully invested. Inve- invested and I'm in prep or shooting or post where I'm like really, really deeply, and I can't even think about anything else. That's when I'm happiest in my work. Yeah. Um, but in a phase where you're developing, pitching, writing, you know, and you sort of have to juggle things because you just don't know what's going to take flight, that's less fun for me, um, but necessary. But I think, and you always hear this, they always say like you could be like i love this I, i've done this before where i i wrote something and i'm like this has to sell this is it this is genius and that's all i'm focused on but if that doesn't sell right which most of the time it doesn't right what else do i have going on so that's why you have to have a lot of things like you have going so that when the one hits hopefully boom i'm going to that right now yeah it's it's that balance has been a constant question or challenge for me because there's also that fantasy I have of, I think of an idea, I spend every ounce of me to get that thing done, get it done, put it out there, take a break, and then do that again. 
Like that would be my fantasy life if I could pull that off. But I've never been realistically, as you said, you have to have a million irons in the fire because you know they're all gonna, yeah, that everything's half the ninety percent of the things aren't not not gonna come to fruition. So it's it's an interesting challenge. It is. Do you you know a lot of times on this podcast we talk to a lot of professionals, a lot of actors, and you know celebrities, whatever about you know how they deal with things how they deal with work with life the balance some people get anxiety some people get depression i get both yeah. uh, you know uh has there been a lot i mean look you're a comedian you're you're someone who puts it all out there there's got to be a do you always have to be doing something and if you're not are you depressed do you get depressed or do you get anxiety how does that i would say uh i i i don't know that i get into what you could call clinical depression or anxiety too much um but i definitely feel like i need to stay busy that's certain something that gets me you know i when i wake up and i'm like not exactly sure what i'm supposed to do that day i that's a bad thing like i really try to have projects in front of me and i've managing my time and attention has been in a, a number one focus and area of anxiety for me for my entire career you know and trying to understand the best way to spend my time and, you know, we all just realize the things like if I have to edit something for whatever reason, that's easy and fun for me. And I can sit there for 12 hours without even going to the bathroom. Right. If I have to write something, it's the opposite. You know, I'll go for one minute and then I get distracted and like, let me go, you know, play a game or whatever. And, and um, if it's a music thing, which is, is only a hobby for me, but that's something that's easy for me to focus on. It just depends on where what I'm doing. But yes, I do. We, we all, I go through all those things. We, we all do. What about being on set? Uh, are you sort of an anxious perfectionist? Got to, I don't want to run out of time. I've got to do this. At the end of the day, you're just exhausted mentally and physically. I'm in a pretty good place on set. I think uh, I learned early on that uh, to be a good director, uh, you just sort of, you, you just arrive into a zone and then you have a plan and you have your brain firing all day and i i really love that and i don't i don't get stressed out on set i i really love wow i feel in the zone when i'm directing but do you ever feel like uh a problem occurs and you don't know how to solve it and you're the cast is looking at you and you just oh, i'm a little oh, shit i'm out of my and does it ever get like amped I, up like I that i have i have found over time that i get if i'm if a problem appears you know like the the wind blows over the set and now what are we going to do I know that those things are going to happen and I just get very zen about it. I'm like, all right, let's figure out how we're going to solve that. And because I think I went through such a trial by fire on my very first thing, Wet Hot American Summer, where it poured rain every single day. Almost every day when um, you're filming yeah, that, right? Daylight exterior, short, low budget shoot. It's supposed to be a nice day. All, it all takes place in one sunny day <laughs> and pouring, pouring rain all day. And so... It was the ultimate daily, like, what the fuck are we going to do situation? And I learned then it's like to let go of what's out of your control, focus on what you, what solutions might be in front of you and just do it. And, and somehow on set with that structure, I thrive, you know, where you don't have to think about what am I going to do today? You, you know, you've got, you've got to get up and do it. And so the, I, I don't, I don't think I would do well to be like someone who's always in production. And so if I was working on a camera crew or something where every day of my life I've, that I work, that I have to do that, I think I would burn out. But I really love, the thing I love the most about my life and my work is that it changes all the time. Sometimes you're really mellow and you're working with one person in a room by yourself, or sometimes you're with a small crew doing something and or you're on set being the general of an army of a hundred. Have you ever had a difficult time with an actor where you're just like, I do not get along with this guy, he's giving me a hard time, this is difficult? Of course. <laughs> And what do you do? Well, I think, you know, first of all, you look around, you're like, it's not me, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not the asshole here. And then you just try to, it's just same, it's actually the same thing as what we were saying. Like, you're just like, okay, so here's the problem. What are the solutions? What are what are the tactics we can use? And you'd be like, okay, in this case, you know, the, do we do we have to fire the person? Do we, or do we just have to have handle Have you had them? to fire anyone before? Oh yeah, sure. You have? Um, yeah. I mean, uh, if you're talking about like an actor during a shoot, yeah, mm, there was one uh, situation I was involved in, so more indirectly, where the actor was being inappropriate. Or no, a couple times, a couple wow. that where somebody was being inappropriate. We just like that has to be the line, sorry, and you have to, and we had to let, fire them mid shoot. 
Um, it was someone you knew, someone you liked at first, or someone you or just uh, a surprise. No, not really. Someone I didn't know well, but somebody like the I, the one that I'm thinking of right now. We were doing a TV show, and an actor came to do a relatively small part, and but was like uh, being super inappropriate with women on set, right. and and we all talked and very quickly we're like we just got to cut bait right here, you know. Right. And uh, but you know, normally if an actor is difficult, you're not going to fire them, but you're going to try to just you know talk to them and say hey you know what you're doing is affecting everyone else and can you not do that you know or or don't just hang out in your trailer well, why and, would i do that david why would i do that right well i mean i know you're that guy you're the why the difficult what i do I never never um i always do what they say but it's just you know i don't think film making is different than any other workplace challenge you know somebody's doing something difficult you got to deal with them and figure it out and try to be understanding but also eyes on the prize of what we're all trying to get done this podcast is brought to you by dove men plus care guys do you get distracted during the day thinking about your underarm sweating or itching or emitting an odor oh. do those thoughts keep you from showing care when it counts new and improved dove men plus care antiperspirant with 72 hour sweat and odor protection and one quarter moisturizing cream helps you forget about your underarms so you can be present for the moments that matter. Don't let underarm insecurities keep you at arm's distance from the ones you care about. Buy new and improved Dove Men Plus Care antiperspirant wherever personal care products are sold. What did you go to NYU for? I, I was into NYU film school. For film school. And right. I concentrated, I, I guess... I used to say I had a concentration in children's TV, but I really only, I took a couple classes in children's TV. <laughs> but uh, basically, I went to film school. And then and, my, and so, I mean, you've told the story, but in a nutshell, who did you bump into first? Was it Showalter mm -mm. or Marino? Me, me and T Todd Hollebeck and Ken Marino Todd. were um, were the in a class ahead. We so we were there as freshmen, and Ken. Marino, I met the first day of school because I was assigned to be roommates with somebody he grew up with in Long Island. And so my, myself and Craig Wedren were living with this guy and Ken Marino knocked on our door and he was like this Italian guy from Long Island. And we were like, <laughs> oh, I love okay. Ken. No, but we were, we loved him from moment one. So we all were hanging out and Todd Hollebeck, basically Mo Willems, who is now the biggest children's book author on earth had started, he was one ahead of us and had started an improv group and a sketch group at NYU and I joined that. And um, then uh, there was a new group that Todd Hollebeck, Todd Hollebeck was in our group and he decided, we decided that we didn't want to let new freshmen into our group. So Todd decided instead to start like a B team, a JV squad, and he left to start a new group. And that was like an open meeting. Anyone who wants to be part of this new sketch comedy group uh, that was like an offshoot of our main group, the Sterile Yak, um, could do it. And then that became the state. That was the group that, you know, and every, the main people from the state, Michael Showalter and Carrie Kenny and Tom Lennon, they all just showed up there. And uh, that became the, that was like the freshman B team group. And then when it became clear to me and pretty much everyone that that group was what was really special, um, our main senior group sort of dissolved and I begged to be part of this, the new group. Really? Yeah. Well, there are a lot of people that got, were there at first, but they kind of were weeded out because they just weren't funny. There and were some, yeah. But it was shocking how much of the main core group was still the same. You know, the state never officially disbanded. We're still a group, it's 11 of us. And this is now 30 plus years later and, and it's the same core. Do you think you'll ever get together again to do something? Yeah, we do. We talk about it actually quite regularly. And really? we've, we've done, we have done, we have reunited with and written new material for certain live shows we've done uh, over the years. And, you know, we're all still friends and we all still recognize how special it was. And we are always talking about brewing something. I see how supportive you are. I was at Joe Latruglio's screening for his film, his horror movie. Great movie. Great, and you were there supporting, and Michael Jan was there, Ken Marino yeah. was there, and it was nice to see after all these years, you guys still support each other. I mean, not just that. We went over to his house when he was editing, and we like helped- Gave notes. Gave notes, and like, we always, it's really great to have, uh, you know, 
a, a core of people that you have each other's backs, even though we've all obviously gone in various different directions and pursued different avenues and worked with different people. But you have sort of like a family that you came from, and it's really nice. Do you try to cast those guys or your close friends? It seems like you do, obviously, in, in just about everything you do, if you can, if it's right. Yeah. I mean, I have over the years um, done that. <laughs> Did they ever get mad when you're like, what happened to my audition? What about me? Yeah, totally. Do they I ever mean, say anything to you? Sure. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> the, it's it's a double-edged sword. Like we, on our movie, The Ten, we tried to cast every single person in the state. And um, you and Ken wrote that. Yeah, me and Ken. Yeah. And we did uh, give everybody a part, but you know, it's like sometimes, you know, when you try to make it a thing and then it's like, it, it, it's, you know how casting is, you never know. It's, it's hard when you have to have a mandate about casting, yeah. um, no matter what. And, but uh, it has definitely been a thing where we try to bring in or, or we end up bringing it like a lot of times, for example, in our movie Wanderlust, we had this part, um, of this guy who's a naked guy running around the this commune and we auditioned all sorts of different actors who were great and like different types and really funny and did you then, audition them naked some of them did what, what, what unasked came in and, and unsolicited auditioned naked, they fully took naked, their clothes off saw their penis it was crazy oh, did you love it I mean, I, I, I mean, love it as in like, like that they, they took the risk, not that you love their dongs. I love the around. memory that that happened, but no, I was not loving that. <laughs> I would rather than not do that. I'm like, you, we can, if we get to there, we'll look at your, yeah, we don't have to later. do that right now. Um, <laughs> any big ones, by the way? Yeah. There were some big dongs. There were some big ones. Yeah. I bet they stretched it and put warm water on it. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to have any, cause I, I have like the biggest penis. Um, <laughs> I'm like one of the one of the I mean it's just sort of famous thing of one of the biggest penises in Hollywood. But uh anyway, the point about that was that we at the end of the day, we as we were trying to figure out how to who's gonna really nail this, we were just like, Oh, let's just get Joe. And then like Joe Latrillo came in and was like the greatest thing. You know, like sometimes for me, the luckiest thing about me is for my taste, these are some of the funniest people I've ever met and ever will meet. And like, you know, it it just happens that we all knew each other in college. So great. Why not? When you were doing the state in your mind, do you recall saying this guy is going to be a star? Were there anybody in the state or where did you just think everybody here is going to be, but what, what, who was the guy or the girl that you were like, they are going to make it in Hollywood. Well, as I mentioned, I wasn't in the group originally. So I got to see their first show, which was like literally freshman at NYU in a little black box theater doing some skits that they wrote. But I was like, holy fuck. And when I think I I think Michael Black stood out to me first. I was like, this guy is so funny. Oh my so god. So funny. But then very quickly I I clocked them all. Michael Showalter and Carrie Kenny. And I was just like, Jesus, these guys are really funny. You know. You know, going back to like putting your friends in things, I, I gotta give it to you. I mean, there's a lot of people out here when they make it, they don't bring people along with them. They don't it, I, I made a little movie. For eight hundred thousand dollars, shot in Indiana. God bless you. Didn't get a uh, tax break, nothing. And I tried to put my friends in the movie as many as I could. Yeah, because it was like I, I just feel better. I have more fun when my friends are around, and they're certainly capable. So when I see you and I see your movies, and you're putting all your friends in, my, my friend Matt Ballard. You always throw Matt a bone. Greatest always, guy. Greatest guy in the world. I've known Matt since college. We did theater together. Yeah. Uh, we lived together in New York. And I love that about you. I always say David Wayne is one of those guys who does the right thing. Well, but who doesn't want to be among friends when you're working? What a great thing, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and I just think it's it makes it fun and exciting. And, you know, it's everything has its pros and cons, but it's just, it's yeah, it's always nice to to if you're in a position no matter what you do for a living if you're in a position to help people you care about why wouldn't you try you know that's certainly how i feel um that's crazy and now listen when i coughed before mm -hmm. just I a little tip a from someone who's been around the block just the tip uh when you're going through later and you're playing down the tape you just edit that take a little razor to that one part <laughs> And you cut, I learned this in college at NYU in 1990. And then you razor out the other side and then you just tape it together very carefully with a piece of white tape. And then the cough is gone. Is that what you have to do now? All that work just for that? I mean, now maybe it's digital. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> these days. Think. I mean, a, fr the, a friend of mine wants to set me up on a home computer. What the what the hell am I going to do with a home computer? But I guess I don't know. A home computer. Is that what he, they call them? Yeah. Apparently, he he doesn't have to anymore um, write down his recipes. <laughs> he can just keep them all in the computer. So okay, I, I guess. <laughs> keep going. Just keep going. Hold on, I'm taking pictures. Everyone has it. Everyone wants to have a website now. Like apparently, you know, it's like it's, everyone's get your own website. Uh, even Microsoft has their own website now, apparently. <laughs> what year are we in? What year is this? Can you call Paul Rudd right now if you wanted and he'd answer? It's possible. <laughs> yeah, he's that good a friend. Uh, would you say he's the top 10 friends of, in your life? Um, yeah, maybe. In, in terms of uh, the whole of my life, he's up there. Talk about a guy. Talk about um, <clears throat> uh, loyalty. First of all, where, did, you, did you just meet him? But you met him before White Hot American, or did he audition? We, I knew, I sort of knew him through Zach Orth because mm. Zach Orth, Zach. the best. best. Oh my God, the best. Zach Orth had been in the Boz Lerman Romeo and Juliet yes. with, with Paul uh, in the late '90s, and basically, Zach invited him to see this weird little play that me and michael shalter and Joel Trulia wrote called sex aka wieners and boobs in 1999 that. and uh he came and was just like oh my god whatever you guys your shtick is right up my alley and so we basically at the time were trying to figure out how to get wet hot american summer put together and we said would you you know attach your and he wasn't a name then not no not really not really he, he had been in 200 cigarettes and he had been in he was in clueless uh, yes and he also had played the romantic lead in um object of my affection with jennifer aniston so he was not a big name at all but he was enough of a name for us to like say like there would be value added to our project if you would be part of it so you just offered him the part so we offered him a part and i didn't really know him or his work that well quite honestly um but i knew i liked what i had seen and i was like that's great it'd be awesome if you were part of it and so um yeah and then i didn't really really get to know him until he came to set to do wet hot american summer were you blown away by how good he was how funny he was i have to admit i was less i was like he's okay i really didn't get it until i was in editing really i that and and it was only then that i was like oh this guy's otherworldly you know and then since and then since then and i was lucky enough to i think make five movies in a row with paul and every fucking take every time like you're just like this guy is magic like he's he's really quite something you know what's amazing is what you just said as a director you're watching him on set and you're going yeah whatever yeah and then you're editing and you're finding out the genius it reminds me of that that show the offer did you see the offer no it's the making of um the godfather mm. And the studio, Robert Evans, was like looking at the Dale. He didn't want Pacino. He says, no, nah, this guy's no good. Bob was a good friend. <laughs> was he? <laughs> to, to many people, I'm sure. <laughs> to many people, I'm sure. But he watched the dailies and he's like, this, this is crap. This is, what is he doing? Hmm. And it wasn't until later when they put it together, he put, they put the genius together. Yeah. So, but how do you, how do you know that you don't know? Well, I mean, everything, yeah, so many things just come with experience and there's just no substitute for understanding that. But uh, yeah, with Paul, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think I was making my first movie and I was thinking about a thousand things and, you know, I just didn't right. really clock how great he was. And, uh, but in post, like I said, we were just like looking at them like, oh my God, this guy's like working on a different level. And then over the years, working very closely with him and, you know, starring in movies that we, you know, we're working together, writing together. I just see how his you know and it seems so he's not the kind of guy that talks about his process that much or like is very uh highfalutin about it at all right. and I'm, i mean i have memories of working on things where he's playing you know scrabble on his phone and until like after we've said action i'm like put your phone away it's time to start and he's like all oh, right, right, right okay and then just boom boom and he's in the like so in it and so real and so funny and also he'll give you in four takes, he'll give you four completely different, but all great and usable options for this amazing, you know, it's, it's a, and it really makes you appreciate, you know, as me, as someone who's done the, a fair amount of acting, but never really 
and great at it and like understand like just the appreciation for that art form is just you know when you see someone who just has that thing you know what are you gonna do dicaprio has that he was doing what's eating gilbert grape yeah and they say that he would just be in like Hi, uh, mama. You know, he'd be, mm -hmm. he'd like, but first he'd be like j joking, farting, and laughing, and doing all these things off stage. And, and actually, he's like, I don't know if you. And he would get into this character like that. Yeah. And that is, it's it's amazing. And I think that a lot of people have to do that. I can't sit there and stew in, in the part and just constantly thinking of the part. I'm best when I'm just talking to people, joking around and action, and then I could jump into it. If I'm thinking about things too much, it's not going to be as good. Yeah. Well, and everyone has a different way to get there and they're all legitimate. Uh, I've learned that too. Every actor has a different process and that's great, you know, and I've done some of my favorite acting of myself when I'm directing at the same time, because I'm not at prevents me from overthinking it right and so if i'm thinking about everything else and then it's just action then i'm just like doing it yeah you're like the hitchcock you, i'm you, like you the, always appear I'm the in your hitchcock movies. of filmmaking that's you're what i've the been hitchcock called. of filmmaking yeah <laughs> the white male hitchcock <laughs> wait, wait a minute wasn't hitchcock <laughs> no in many ways yes have you um ever worked with actors who have an intense method or way of working oh, where, yeah. where sure. you just don't go to them go don't talk who's one that's just an intense person but amazing and you love working with Oh my God, well, let me think. Um, I mean, like uh, Maloney, Chris Maloney has a, oh, an intense so presence on sense, you know, and he'll, he'll be very thoughtful and he'll, he'll, you'll, <laughs> he does that thing where you're talking to him about like, you're trying to answer a question he has and he won't respond back even with a look and you're just like, then just keep nattering off at the mouth and, and, but you can tell he's just thinking and, and like processing and, you know, everybody's got you know and he's just really thinking it through and it's like the dumbest scene about whatever and he's like mm -hmm, okay yeah no well, i could see we'll try that and then again. he puts it together and you're like wow yeah oh i've blown my mind uh, it's amazing I've also worked, but I, I will say i've worked with and i can't i honestly can't remember names but i've worked with some actors maybe in smaller ways where they really get enamored with like the method type work and then and it's just bullshit you know and, and you're just like just okay. come and do just it just act just shut up you know or like, and it's that famous, to me, it, it's that thing of sometimes the reason why this character would do it is because it's written down in the set on the sides and you were paid to be here to do it. So that's why, <laughs> that's the reason. Like, yes. <laughs> Have you ever dealt with insecure actors who are, you're just like, how do you deal with an insecure actor? Someone who can't get it, who's really in their head. You could tell they're nervous. That happens all the time. And sometimes you just have to be like, okay, let, let's you know, give me a second and you go off the side and be like, Hey, you got this or whatever, you know, just, it's being a coach. You know how to make them comfortable. Yeah. Or I've tried. I mean, the, the being a director, which one's so fun is like, sometimes you just have to be like a cheerleader or a coach or a therapist or a parent or, you know, or, and then sometimes you have to just learn to let someone do their thing and leave them completely alone and try, trying to say as little as possible. It just depends. And it's fun. I, I always remember we're doing a scene in, um, wet hot American summer where, Janine Garofalo, who really thrives on just showing up and just spouting off and improvising and doing whatever and not thinking about it as much. And Marguerite Moreau was one of her first things. And she really wanted to rehearse and really get it right and really like get the beats all down. And we had two very separate ways of processing. And it was fun to try to figure out, you know, how to make that work. And I would, I went and ran the scene a lot with Marguerite and like made sure she felt comfortable and like there was everything was covered um but then left space for janine to do her thing but know? some people just don't like to rehearse too much they don't want to they'll go through the blocking but they don't want to no they want to feel it for the first time really when they're rolling and that's got to be difficult when another actor is like no i want to rehearse it can be or or sometimes an actor wants to do 20 takes you know they they want to like warm up in in the actual shooting they're like I don't really get going until it's you don't take like 10. that do you well i personally would i can't that i can't do <laughs> I, I don't have the patience or the attention span or usually ever the budget to to do that. <laughs> You're like, we got to move. Yeah. Or I just, I also just feel like it's really diminishing returns at a certain point. You're like, you you know, you hopefully you've worked on the script and you've worked on the rehearsing if there's rehearsing, but, and then when the camera's rolling and there's a hundred people there, you got to just sort of, you got it. Great. Let's keep going. I don't see you losing your shit. Have you ever lost your shit on set where you're like, God damn it. It, I mean, in 30 years it's happened, but it's been very rare and it's not terrible, but I've, I've, 
I've had moments where I've like raised my voice and been like, God, you know, but right. it, I would say compared to most, probably pretty minor. It's pretty amazing, like Wet Hot American Summer, the legs that it has. I mean, you're shooting this movie in rain, no sunlight. It's your first movie, first feature. This is it. No budget. Yeah. A, a lot of great actors in this, character actors. Yeah. How many days did you shoot this? It was 29 uh, total, including one day of reshoot. I remember, but it was shooting on film with one camera. So One you, camera you shot that with? Yeah, well, you know, most things were shot with one That's camera true. at the That's time. That's true. This is in the year 2000. And so that just to keep that in mind when people are like, oh, I shot a movie in nine days. It's like, yeah, but it's one camera and you're rolling 35 millimeter. So you have to reload. And we also had limited stock. That was the other thing. You couldn't just shoot as much as you want. That was not a, at all an option, you know? And when we would have a day where we'd shoot a lot of film stock, the producer would be like, dude, can't use so much film. It was, it was like, there's a lot of challenges. Wow. When Yeah, when you went home at night after day one or day five or day eight, when you're lying in bed and you close your eyes. Lying in the camp bunk. That's where you guys slept? Yeah. With other people around you? Yeah, well, I had I had my own room. Thank God. But not everybody did. Did you masturbate? I, I'm sure I did. Okay. Um, when I directed, I was too too exhausted to masturbate. I, it's the last thing I could have I done. always make time. You make time. Good for you. But when you're lying there, how many times out of this 22-day whatever shoot would you close your eyes and go, I'm a failure. This is never going to work. This, is, this probably isn't going to work. I'm doomed. My I, dreams are falling I, apart. To the best I can remember from 20-plus years ago, I really felt like during that shoot it was just i was enjoying it and having fun and i was like it was exciting and i was working on the daily challenges and i wasn't and i and i was recognizing at the time how lucky we were to be able to shoot this thing and i wasn't thinking so much about whether there was no expectation that it would even come out like i i was like if we finish this movie and it gets a review in the new york times that's the that's the goal that's all i wanted and it never occurred to me that it would be in the consciousness 20 years later. That was just not even on the radar. You know, I think, you know, when I, when I directed a movie, I always, you know, you want it to be successful. You want it to be whatever, but I really, at the end of the day, wanted my brother to laugh. Yeah. And I wanted the cast to really enjoy it. Yeah. And they did. And I could tell at the premiere, the real laughs. And that's that meant everything to me. Totally. This is what I wanted to do. This is what I could do. And I'm, I'm proud that I did that. But you knew you had something good on your hands. Well, you edited. I think that we had the lucky situation where Michael Showalter and I took three years to get them financing to, to make this movie. And we kept rewriting it. And we kept, we had this producer who was Howard Bernstein was helping us out. And like, we would just like, keep diving back in and even though it was you know on the surface a dumb script we just really kept honing it and we're like well let's no let's make this better let's make this better so by the time we got to set we really did have a very solid script i think and that was everything you know, that's, that's everything will there be any more wet hot american summers i doubt it i feel like we sort of did the a very sort of final ending to it at the end of the wet hot 10 years later on netflix 10 years later and first day of camp yeah do you uh, ever go back to Ohio? Do you ever go back for a reunion? Have you gone to a reunion? In Ohio where I grew up? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I go, well, I, I go to home. My family's still there. Right. And so I go there, you know, once, one to three times a year. <laughs> Are they uh, very proud of you? Yeah, yeah. Do they, um, do they get your humor? Do they watch these things and go, that's really funny? Yeah, it's funny. I think a lot of times they'll, some people in my family will enjoy it, but on a different level. They're like, oh, that's so sweet or that's so cute. You know, and, <laughs> and my parents were very, my parents both are uh, passed away, but they, uh. they both were, so, their reactions to things were so funny sometimes. You're just like, they're like, well, that I just really didn't get. And, you know, and <laughs> this one I hate. And in fact, I, <laughs> we had I my, don't say hate. Oh, yeah. They're like, this part. In fact, we, um, <laughs> I had my parents do with me and Ken the commentary on our movie, The Ten, because I just wanted to hear their like blow by blow, you know, commentary on the whole thing. Because they, they were, <laughs> that movie really pushes the envelope in terms of tasteless things. And, and 
there were things in there that they really genuinely hated and i wanted to get that on the record <laughs> and what'd they say they're like this one no i we th i don't know why you had to do this one david you know just like <laughs> did you love it oh i loved it oh man this is great um let me ask you this what's the hardest moment you've had to deal one of the hardest things you've had to deal with in your life so far career-wise or personal what when you think of the first thing that comes to you that this is the hardest thing i've had to go through um i would say that the truth is no work thing has ever been as hard as just certain family relationship things you know i've been through marriage and divorce and uh you know different choices around where to proceed there and moving to LA at a certain point. And, you know, that sort of real life stuff has been usually, you know, I've had, I've certainly had work stresses and big problems or choices and, or, and many, many, many defeats, like many fail things that have fallen apart at the last minute or jobs that didn't come through in the last minute or projects that I've worked really hard on that failed, you know, many, most, um, but I'm sort of used to that. And the fact I, I look at it like, um, I still don't have to get a job, uh, working behind the counter somewhere. And so that's the win and everything else is a bonus. And I try to look at it like that. Do you, do you think you're more fearless now after dealing with rejection, after dealing with the ups and downs, do you feel like you were more fearless when you were just starting this business or do you think over the years, things have happened which made you a little bit more insecure it's it's a, a very it sounds like i'm evading the answer but it's both i think that you know you're just life changes you in different ways and sometimes i feel like i'm more in the zone and more like sort of don't have to even try and things happen and sometimes i feel like it's things are more effortful and i and i'm you know, and obviously when, if you have four things in a row that fall apart, you feel less secure about what you're doing. Right. If you have four things in a row that take off, then you feel more like you're invincible. It's just natural. Do you always feel like, uh, or do you feel, I always think when I'm deciding on a job or I get something, you know, that I could potentially do, I feel like I don't want to let this person down. I don't want to let my agent down. I don't want to let mm. this down. Yeah. I don't want to, and I, I don't even think about me most of the time. Right. Like, what do you fucking want? Yeah, that you what should do you, you really should do that. Want? You should think about you shouldn't think it certainly don't worry about your agents and stuff. Well, you know, you want to make the money. They say this is a great deal. You keep saying no They'll be to okay. things. They'll be okay. They'll be fine. Yeah. They have other clients. And also don't worry about them. It's just that's not your job. Their job is to help you. Thank you. I David. think. You're right. <laughs> who's the who's the one person that you think of when you're really at a low that you you want to call and just hear their voice and they'll make you feel better? Well, I mean, my mom, and I can't do that. Ugh. Yeah. Was that that was the hardest thing for you, wasn't it? That was pretty tough. How old was she? Seventy four. Was it unexpected? No, she was sick for a few years. But she so, knew, yeah, it was. It was like it was. We had the blessing of being knowing she was going and being to, able to be with her literally at that time. And but it was, you know, there's. I don't think there's any scenario or time or way to lose a parent that's okay you know it's there's it's never like oh that was the she lived a long life and she died peacefully so everything so i'm happy about it you know yeah doesn't matter I, I envy you because i have a feeling by talking about her how much you loved her. i could tell by your emotion but like she knew how much you loved her and you knew how much she loved you is that right yeah i think that that means a lot that's very yeah. important to walk away with knowing like there's no there's no way she didn't know how much i freaking love that one you know yeah um you know yeah life and death is all fucked up <laughs> I, I you know it's funny because my uncle said something to me while i was visiting my grandma who's 94 blanche also have a dog blanche um it's weird it's weird and he said you know we we're talking about death and I'm not very close. I love my mother. I love my father. Ryan knows the story. I, I, I love them. And he said something. He's like, yeah, you know, like we're talking about death. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be responsible for taking care of the funeral and taking care of this. And, you know, it's like all this. And he's like, I think you should definitely see a therapist and talk to her or him about 
losing your mother because I think that's going to be really hard for you. Mm. And I go, what? I, we're not really close. I don't talk to her that much. He goes, that's why. And yeah. he's a psychologist. And he's like, I'm not trying to be Mr. Doctor here, but I think that it's going to hit you probably harder than you thought. And that scares me. It scares me that I'm not as close where I could just, I love you, mom. I love you so much. I, I you know, I don't, you know, and, and her, I know it's just, it's just a different relationship. I do love her. But every, yeah, it's, it's, there's no, I really do feel like there's no, every situation is wildly different in every way. And so there's no template for any of this. And I have a very good friend who just lost her mother and they were not close at all. And they had a lot of tension over all, all the years. And, you know, it's, it's hard for her in a very different way, you know, and it's, but it's, I don't know that I would have recommended that she went and made amends with her and tried to be close with her again, because that wasn't in the cards for that relationship, you know, so it just depends. Gotcha. All right. This is called shit talking with David Wayne. Okay. These are my top tier patrons. They get to ask questions. Go to patreon.com slash inside of you. These are top Join, tier support patrons. Support the podcast. Top tier patrons. Patreon patrons. They are. Okay. And they're going to ask questions. This is rapid fire. Or you can, if you feel like answering them long ways, you can. Okay. G uh, Gianna H. Hi, have, Gianna. Hi, Gianna. <laughs> Do you have any standout memories from the 10, one of my all time faves? Thank you for mentioning the 10, Gianna. Um, this was a movie from 2007, six, six, seven, 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 seven. Uh, and it, it was 10 different stories, each one inspired by one of the 10 commandments right. that I did with Ken Marino uh, and Paul Rudd. Uh, and, um, yeah, oh, it's uh, many great memories. Um, get, getting to work with uh, Winona Ryder, who was one of the weirder and greatest uh, <laughs> actors I ever knew. Like she was the, so awesome and very strange in the, all the best ways. Um, we got to shoot four days of it in Mexico, in the, in San Miguel de Allende, and it was like a very surreal experience. And working with a uh, this low budget Mexican crew who just didn't do anything that we asked, but then did all these other things that we didn't ask for. And it was just like a weird, like, you know, we would, uh, we would say, Oh, it's too bad. There's all those like antennas on the roofs of those buildings. And they're like, okay. And they just like cut them all off. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, or we had to do a scene where somebody, Justin throws walking on water and they like uh, built this whole uh, scaffolding under the water without any safety. Like, there was no concern for any rules or anything. <laughs> but then I would be like, hey, let's bring these decorations on this day. And they're like, oh, no, the guy just didn't come. And we're like, well, oh, we said it was going to. And he's like, no, didn't, well, just didn't. <laughs> it's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and I was like, oh, but we all said we were going to start shooting at 10. And they're like, well, you know, 10, 11, 12, whatever. You know, it's like, anyway, it's very funny. But, <laughs> oh my um, God. Uh, yeah, I, I, it was the, the, the 10 was a real blast what's the weirdest thing winona ryder did she, well she, she sometimes would just go, uh, we would be uh, literally about to roll like okay you know at lights camera action we're about to start and then she'd be like wait a second and then would take me off to the side and talk about i'm not sure what <laughs> just like random random and i'm like oh okay should we go back to the <laughs> but she was awesome we really is i mean she's she Another one who's just like that camera rolls and you're like, oh my God, she's so good. Wow. And and was just the lovely. I really Did you ever get starstruck? Was she somebody you initially were a little starstruck oh, yeah. by? Big time. Uh, I don't get starstruck too often. Um, never did too much, but you know, there's those certain people that you have a real relationship with from your own fandom in the past that, you know, you meet them and um but uh, you know. In fact, it was interesting. I just recently worked with Steve Buscemi. Oh who I've actually, I've actually met him a few times over the years and I've, uh, you know, and, and so, but for whatever reason, I was just like so struck by him. He was so cool. And I was just like excited to be in his midst the whole time. What do I gotta be Mr. Pink for? Yeah, that's uh, him. What a great, great actor. You're Ooh. great, you're a great mimic. Thanks. I didn't want to say the next line. I can't say it. All right. You know the next line of that? No, I don't remember. What do I gotta be Mr. Pink for, Joe? Cause you're a... Oh. Yeah. yeah. Leanne, what challenge in your life have you overcome that you're extremely proud of? Well, as I said, I learned the Rubik's Cube finally. <laughs> there you go. That's it. That's great. Yeah. Rapid fire. Raj, tell me about an audition you felt went well, did but didn't work out. How did you work through that feeling of rejection? Well, as uh, I'm not primarily an actor, right. um, but I have done 
quite a number of auditions actually. And there's been a lot of times, 90% of the time, if I do an audition, I feel like that was pointless. I suck. But sometimes I'm like, oh my God, I am literally that guy. There's no, it'd be crazy for them not to cast me. Um, and then they just don't. And But I know from having been on the other side of it so many times that the reasons could be anything. You know, it could be that uh, there's there's no rhyme or reason to why, the, ultimately, why one person gets a job and someone else doesn't. And so you can never take it personally. Have you ever seen a big actor audition for you and bomb? Yes. Just bomb. Yeah. And they're a great actor. I mean, we had, um, when we did the, the movie Wanderlust, Judd Apatow was the producer and there was just a decision made that like everyone had to audition, even if they were big names. Um, and so we had a lot of big names come and sit and read our dumb script. And it was really sort of embarrassing in a way to be like, thank you, sir, for coming in here. Like, I don't know why you even have to do this. Um, but you know, some people are just not that good at auditioning. It has nothing to do with their acting ability. Yeah, auditioning is not easy. Yeah, it's a whole different skill. And so, yeah, there I've seen I've seen big people bomb, but you know, I think auditioning is a very sometimes necessary but very imperfect way to to choose actors for something. Would you rather just sit in a room with somebody and talk to them, knowing that you've seen some of their work and you know they're good, and just have a conversation? Will this person be good on set? Will he be fun? Can yeah, you do it. I think yes, that has some value to it, but I also think that's also imperfect. I think better the best thing I, I feel like seeing people's work on screen is number one like uh, there, there should be much more emphasis i think on reels and just like and if they haven't done anything you can make a reel or make a self-tape i guess but I, I i it's i just feel like um especially anyone who's been around the block at all i just have a lot of friends who are actors who continually audition after audition after audition i'm like don't they you've been on yeah. 40 things like pick, i could do this in my sleep like why do you have to, why do you ever have to audition again like and it, it breaks my heart that they've worked so hard because auditioning is hard you've got to do yeah. it you know you don't want to put out a bad one so yeah last question little lisa what is something you have always wanted to do but have not tried yet something purely dramatic non non-comedic directorially writing directing whatever you want to do something really dark Something dark or just something that's not comedy first. I just, I feel like, it could, you know, not that it's a crutch, but I just, I, I, I love uh, dramatic things, and I, and I've, I just haven't had the chance to do something that is not relying on the comedy as the main engine of it. Where can people follow you? What's your, what's your handle? David Wayne, W A I N, and it's the same handle on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, TikTok. I hope you invite me sometime to play music in your garage. You're in, so invited. I'm you're I'm dying for you to come. Ah, it's it looks like so much fun. You have these videos that are go to his site, go to his handle, his Instagram. Yeah, oh, DavidWayne.com also. Yeah. DavidWayne.com. I mean, just hilarious. And you've got these great musicians and these actors. I mean, and really singing songs that we know and love. Yeah. It's basically me and my middle-aged dad friends and you, for example. <sighs> And we, uh, and we just get together in the garage and just play rock songs just for fun. Um, and then it's, I've put a few little clips of it online, but it's um, truly, it's the, one of those things that's just fun thing for friends to do and there's no goal around it and there's no- Agenda. There's agenda, a, this there's is no just reason. Fun. But we're working hard just because it's fun to, to put effort into it um, and make it sound as good as we can, but there's just, it's leading to nothing and that's part of the joy of it. Do you have a big say in the music that's in your movies? Yeah, well, I'm very, I've always been a musician uh, as a hobbyist or, you know, just interested in music. And so, and I've worked very closely with Craig Wedren, who's been the composer on just about everything I've done. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm very, very, I'm very hands-on about all the aspects of the movie and, and, and the music is no exception. Did you pick Jane for the Wet Hot American series? And not only did I pick Brilliant. Jane, it was one of the very first what a choice. choices. It was from the movie originally. And I, I remember hearing that I was driving with my mom in her car sometime in the late 90s when I was thinking about Wet Hot American Summer and what it would be. And when that song came on, I was just like, that has to be the opening credits, no matter what. And we were a low budget movie. And, you know, I think we ended up putting enormous amount of our budget and just our resources in making, finding a way to get that song. And it was, uh, 
I love it so much. <laughs> is it, what would you say? Wet Hot American is, is is the one that you treasure dear to your heart. Is it the what's what's the, your favorite project that you've done? I know they're all close to you. They're all, but the one that you're like, I had the most fun. This is the most rewarding. This. It's a really honestly hard question it's a hard to answer question because because they've like yeah Wet Hot was the first movie that I did with a real crew and it was like so and it, obviously it has a very special place in my heart and it was an incredible experience in many ways and I I often associate the project with the experience of doing it less the final thing mm -hmm. um, so you know like the role model like every they all have different wonderful memories and different stresses that come to mind. And they were different phases in my life. You know, in one, I had little tiny kids and in one I was going through this in my relationship or in this other one, I was sad because of this or happy because of that. So I, those are the associations in a way with the projects, but, and then there are other ones like, you know, we did the show medical police on mm -hmm. uh, Netflix, which really just came and went with a thud, like nobody watched it or cared about it. And and that was really sad for me, like, cause I thought it was awesome and as good as anything else. Um, but, and then there was things like Children's Hospital, which was like a seven Brilliant. year long, yeah. beautiful job that got to do every year and wonderful family of people. And, you know, so I I have been teased by my friends for being a big fan of all my own work, but right. I am. And Good. <laughs> Last question, this is it. What would you say to young directors trying to make it, trying to make a name for themselves? What would you, what, because somebody who really created their own work, I mean, you created your own success. Yeah. What would you say to them? Well, it's, it's so interesting because my, when I was younger trying to figure it all out, the world couldn't have been more different in every possible way. YouTube didn't even exist. Right. You know, there was no email uh, when I first started off. And, and so, um, today and also the the tools of production are available to anyone so you can make you can actually make an excellent looking feature film yourself for five hundred dollars like and that that's just insane from what from where i came from you know and so uh as far as advice i think that there's no substitute for just doing the work of understanding how to the the, the art of storytelling and learning english and history and philosophy and you know things that i still feel like i didn't do enough and but and reading and there's no substitute for actually reading real books and all of that if you do those things you're going to be ahead of 90 percent of people who are doing this stuff and then yeah grab the camera and do your own thing and put it up online and you know there's no specific one path that i can say is the way to get into it but um I would say just make sure if it's something you care about, do do something to move you towards that goal every day. This has been awesome. Hasn't this been awesome? I really, hope so. I, I really just I, I thought I was going to be talking about your childhood and talking about all, and it just it was so easy to just talk to you about Listen, just just shit. You're a great life. interviewer. Thank you. And this is I'm not, I know I hope this sounds like I'm saying this is bullshit, but I think this is literally the best podcast in the world. What? And that sounds like I'm being exa I'm exaggerating. I haven't listened to it yet, <laughs> but I'm going to. Oh, I <laughs> really appreciate I'm that. I'm going to listen to it. <laughs> thank you. We could edit that part I'm going to catch up. <laughs> we could just take that little. David, thank you for allowing me to be inside of you today. I always wish you the best. I hope to work with you someday. Great I think to you're see you, brilliant. my friend. I, we met. Do you remember where we met? Specifically, no, but I, I remember uh, many nice experiences of hanging out with you over the years. The movie was called 1999. It was oh, 1998, right. I believe, when we made it, or 97. Right, right, right. And uh, you were always on the set. I think you were friends with the director, Nick Davis. That's right. And uh, it was Jennifer Wait, Garner's. Can we, can we talk about this for a second? Sure. Can we keep going? Sure, sure. Because the, the story of that is you were in that movie. I remember this now. And the... Um, I had never, I was hoping to make Wet Hot American Summer, but I had never been on a feature film set in my life. And I was like, how am I going to do this? And so I, my friend Nick was making a movie and I said, I forget how I even knew him, but I said, oh no, I, I he wasn't my friend. I, somehow I just, I went to Film Threat, the magazine and said, I'm going to, can I do a story about the behind the scenes of making this movie for film threat but it was really just an excuse for me to like hang out on a film set and i think that's how i met nick davis i don't even know what my you connect. know it's funny i remember seeing you going 
you look sort of like you know you're just pensive and yeah just, and i go that, yeah, i guess he's the producer or something I don't no know. i was <laughs> i was technically there as a reporter and and i remember yeah it was uh F Fetter Fetterman, uh, Dan, Futterman. Dan, Dan Futterman, and and Amanda Pete, and Jennifer Garner, and Jennifer Garner, and what's his name? Uh, Joe, Hank, Egan, Hank, Joe Hank, Egan Hank, and Jerry uh, Rafferty were his, a duo known as Steelers Wheel when they came up with this. Oh yeah, Stephen Wright, pop. Stephen Wright, and uh, Buck Henry. Who Buck Henry, Catch like what an incredible cast. Graduate. Meanwhile, uh, and Timothy Oliphant. Right. He was my buddy in that movie. Yeah. What an amazing group. It was a group. So then another it wasn't the best movie. I guess Can not. I not say that? No, you know, it, it the problem was the cinematography. It just yeah, it was a little terrible. Bit, yeah. Well, it was very low budget. Very low budget. But I also um the people who've made the, the who made it were very nice and and yeah. I stayed in touch with them a bit over the years. And then another actor who was in that movie was Zandy Hardig, who I didn't really meet on the set when I but I saw her there and remember her from that. But I then met her like five years later and married her. But you met her on the set of 1999? Yeah. But I didn't remember that as well. But I remember her from the movie and I remember I remember seeing her there, but I didn't actually meet her till like t late 2004. Um, and then I married her and had two kids with her. And you remember seeing me? I do. You do? I do. I have this long hair and this yep. pleather jacket. Yeah. Just so happy and excited about being on a set it was my first feature so exciting i was like oh my gosh this is great yeah boy the time just flies since that was the 90s it was for the 21st century it's almost 25 years ago all right fuck that all right see you man love Bye. you <laughs> <laughs> great guy a lot of fun and uh very knowledgeable and uh we got deep we got deep and uh it's always nice when people open up as i always say and uh, if you enjoyed it, again, write a review. Tell me what you think. Follow the podcast. Follow our handles at Inside of You Podcast on the um, Facebook and Instagram at Inside of You Pod on the Twitter. We've got the Inside of You online store with tons of Smallville merch and I Inside of You merch. And uh, we'll, again, we'll be in Chicago this weekend. So hopefully you'll be there hanging out with us. And um, I'm going to give the shout outs. Uh, top tiers of Patreon, patreon.com slash talkville. We need you. Support the podcast if you will. I'll try to write you a message, but uh, anything is great. Patreon.com slash talkville. And here we go. All right. Nancy D, Leah S, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko. I just sent these people uh, things I had a 20% off on inside of you, and tons of people uh, said, yes, now I'm going to buy stuff. 20% off. That's good. So maybe I'll do some more of those things. Um, Jill E, Brian H, Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Sophie M, Sophie M. We'll get you that Tuesday cup, that glass. I promise. I just got to remember. Raj, all good. Raj C, thanks for the movie reviews. Uh, Joshua D, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Mike E, El Don Supremo, 99 more, Santiago M, Chad W, Leanne P, Janine R, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda N, Dave uh, N. H. Correct. Jesus. Correct. You got it. Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Tab of the T, Tom N, Liliana A. We got Talia. That's a tough one. C. M. Yeah. Betsy. D. Chad. L. B. Or W. Or Dan B. N, Angel M, Rhiannon C, Corey K, Dev. Nixon. Correct. Michelle A, Jeremy C, Brandy. Uh, Carlisle. D. That's right. Darlisle. <laughs> Camille asks Joey M, Eugene and Leah. My sweet Eugene and Leah. We also have an eye itch right now, so I'm pausing for station identification. Uh, Corey, Heather L, Jake B, Megan T, Angela F, Mel S, Orlando C, Caroline R, Christine S, Eric H, Shane R, M R, Andrew M, Zadoichi 77, Andreas N, Oracle, Karina N, Amanda R, Jen, Jen B, Kevin E, Stephanie K, Jorel, Jam and J, Leanne J, Luna R, Cindy E, Mike F, Stone H. Miss S, Brian I, Katie B, Aaron R, Kendall L, Kendall, hi Kendall, mm. House J, what's up, Meredith I, what is going on, Prof. Dr. Scoots, Professor Dr. Scoots, I'm assuming, Charlene C, Kara C, Mary R, Kyle F, Marisol P, I, you know, I think, no, yeah, I think that's it, I think that's it, is that all you have? I don't have a sheet. How dare you? 
Oh, it's right here. I'm doing these names from memory. From memory. From memory. Uh, thanks so much for listening to the podcast today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. We got so many great uh, guests coming on. And I think what's nice is that the stuff I told you, Ryan, that the podcast is getting more established. It's easier to get guests. Um, and it's word of mouth. Like Jonathan Frakes goes, I love doing it. And I go, could you get me Brent Spiner, Gates McFadden from Star Trek? He's like, yeah. And they're going to do the podcast. And, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the guy Ryan Kelly, who was Ryan in Smallville and, and, and the show Ryan, and, uh, he's his name's actually Ryan Kelly, and uh, he was on Teen Wolf, I believe. Mm. He's going to come on. He's got a big following, and he says he's going to do it. So a lot of great uh, guests coming up. I hope you'll stick with the podcast. Join Patreon. And uh, Ryan, still going to therapy? Still going to therapy. Good. Yeah. We all need it. Yeah, it's good. I definitely need it. Oh, yeah. I was, yeah. Con- I was confused for a second because Ryan Kelly is also the guy who taught me trumpet. I thought you were going to have my trumpet teacher on, but I guess you're not. Really? Yeah. You play trumpet? Could you pick it up Once right upon now? A time. I could. The muscle memory would come back. Is a trumpet more like? No, it's like. But yeah, you, you have to buzz. Like, you have to that, buzz your lips. That sounded like my butt. That's how you have to play trumpet. Thanks for listening. I'm Michael Rosenbaum from the Hollywood Hills <laughs> in California. I'm Ryan Tales. That's correct. Uh, a little wave to the camera. We love you guys. Couldn't do the show without you. I, I say it all the time, but I mean it. And you know I mean it. So um, thanks for the support. Thanks for the love. And most importantly, Ryan. Uh, always hold on to small film. No, <laughs> that's not it. What's the other one? Uh, be good to yourself. Be good to yourself. That's the most important thing. Just be good to yourself. Um, if, if today you're like not happy with yourself, give yourself a break. Tomorrow's a new day. Let's do it. I'm not preaching. I'm just saying the facts. Gotta love yourself. I'm trying. I'm really trying. All right. We'll see you next week.